Bird, 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 bird. Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey, everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. It is November the 21st as I sit here in the man cave slash kennel slash recording studio slash dog house with four dogs sacked out on the futon, two of them put away for tearing up the futon, one being my new little puppy. I turned around earlier, and he's got half the stuffing pulled out of this futon mattress. I've never seen him do that. Anyway, that's how my Sunday's starting off. Other than that, I've had a great weekend. Got a bunch of wood cut yesterday for the back porch. Keep that wood stove cranking for the wintertime. You know, this is the time of year that I don't like because unless I travel, which is hard to do because of the holidays coming up and things I put off in October, this is where Michigan shuts down their small game season for the deer hunters. Now, you could go into all kinds of stuff, but I don't understand why the state of Michigan, I could see recommending staying out of the woods. I could see maybe prohibiting you uh, from public land, which I don't think that's right either, because the rest of the year we can share public land with hunters out there. Um, but anyway, you know, we we in Michigan have to put our guns away, put our shells away, we have to put our onyx away, we have to put our pike gear away, we have to put our boss shot shells away, we don't use our Waltons unless we pulled something out of the freezer. You know, I am using a Purina, got to feed the dogs every day. Gunner kennels getting no use, my Garmin's getting no use, canine athletes getting no use. W hunting supply, well, there's always a use for it, but I, I sure don't need anything right now, nothing immediate. Even my deck drawer system, which holds all, almost all those items, isn't getting any use. It's, it's, the worst two, it's the worst two weeks in Michigan. December 15th to December 30th, you got to stay out of the woods. Could be some of the best grouse hunting. There's no snow yet. Our leaves are finally down off the trees. And, and I can't go out. You know, it's, it's crazy. Um, that was a quick little interruption. Look at it, two minutes and I got it done. I do, I do have to say our last Patreon Zoom room was pretty epic. We, we got into uh, legal transportation of shotguns and ammunitions while flying. We got, into, um, we got into South Dakota juvenile, no, that's not right, South Dakota road hunting stories. And boy, we had some good ones. Uh, we got into a little bit of breeds. Uh, we did a little breed stuff, I think, on the Munsterlander. We did. We did. We got into a lot of different subjects, and it was great. And you should join if if there's one reason to join Patreon, it's to come into the Zoom room and create uh, create your own week or by you know bi monthly. Can you say bi nowadays? I don't even know if you can twice a month Zoom rooms that you get to meet some new people. We, we've got a really core gr great core group and a few new ones come in every week. Um, I don't think we could ever handle all the patrons that are out there, but, you know, everybody's busy. Some kids got soccer and wrestling and football and who knows what. Um, but I really, I look forward to those two Thursdays a month as much as the people who joined in. And one of them, uh, I'll leave Bryce's name out of it. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, is going to start a hunting dog podcast uh, group. Now, if it gets out of hand and it gets silly and it gets stupid, we'll, we'll have some details on that. I haven't even dived into it. But we're going to have one where you could, whether you're a patron or not, you could join in and see what's going on. You could share information, share some stories. We're going to try that. Um, the other thing I think you should try is pike gear. Now, right now, Brent called me up yesterday and says, Tell your listeners that he's going to have a bunch of different holiday sales. They're going to come. They're going to go. They're going to be up here. They're going to be down there. And go to Pike Gear. Get your email in there so you can get your notifications when the vests or the pants or the shirts or the hoodies or the socks or the, 
you know, everything but the water bottles going on sale. So go to Pike Gear, sign up on their website, and get the first. Because there's only, just like everything in the supply chain, there's only so much Pike Gear. And there's only so much time before Christmas. So there. Um, like I said, everything else, everything else is put on the shelf, you know. On X, haven't used it. CZ, haven't pulled a trigger. Boss shot shells, haven't stuck them in my CZ. Walt, I did use some Walton seasoning yesterday. We, uh, we had venison, or I'm not venison. Well, it is venison, technically. We had elk tenderloin that my son-in-law brought home from a, 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 a hunt he was on. A shoot, so to speak. He was a videographer. He's an editor. And he was lucky enough that they shared some, they gave him, do you ever see an elk tenderloin? It's like the size of your leg. Like, if you cut your foot off and your hip tapered down to the size of your ankle, that's like the size of an elk tenderloin. We had that and some white fish that he had just caught in the Grand Haven Channel. Had a little surf and turf. So the Waltons did get a little used to. Purina gets use every day, twice a day. Um, I do. People ask me, I do feed my dogs twice a day. I don't feed them twice as much as when I'm on the road. When I'm on the road, they only eat at night after they've exercised. That's just a safer way of doing things. They, they get more digestion out of it. But the Purina... Is uh, that that's an everyday thing? The Gunner Kennels. Actually, I used one yesterday to lock up my daughter's Labrador in, um, but that's a story for another podcast. <laughs> Haven't touched my Garmin, like I said. Shame on me. Um, yeah, it's just we're closed down here. We're just closed down here. Anyway, canine athlete. Yeah, you could still use that. You don't you don't need to be hunting to use that. And you could certainly go to wilderness athletes and find some really great supplements. My that probiotic they have that I've been taking made a difference in my overall, we won't go there, my overall digestion, let's just say that. Um, always, if you're looking for something, if you're looking for something in the hunting dog world, in the supply world, especially in the e-collar world, go to W Hunting Supply and uh, look at getting your deck drawer system sooner than later so you can have it all decked out for next season. Yeah. Oh, that was corny. That was corny. Hey, Shooting Sportsman Magazine got me the host or got me the guest that you're going to hear on this podcast, and it was uh, it was fun. It was Tom Davis is basically just over a year older than me. He's been in the outdoor world. He's been hunting back in the day. This episode is basically a couple of old guys reminiscing. I mean, of course, we talk about the writing, how to write, or how he writes how he got started, all of his dogs. But you'll see the theme of it. When you get somebody that's about the same age as you and you're my age, I, we could have went on forever. In fact, after we hit the end of the Zoom meeting, we did. We just kept talking. Now he's been sending me some articles to, to read that he's written. Um, great author, great writer. He's got some great books out. I have one of them. Uh, check out Tom Davis and check out Shooting Sportsman Magazine and go back and listen to the discounts you get for Shooting Sportsman, if you're a listener or a patron. And lastly, lastly, if you're an Upland Institute, if you're Upland Institute curious and you've already gone to our site, if you haven't, go to that website, hit the contact page. There's a little news coming up in November, right after Turkey Day. That translates to you know what, okay? But if you're not on our email list, you're not going to find out what's coming up. So go to Upland Institute. Be a better trainer. Have a better dog than you did this year. And if you had a great dog this year, well, you probably already joined up the Upland Institute. You already already are a better trainer. Anyway, that's it. Um, I did, <laughs> uh, people who know me or people who've heard me on other podcasts, I kind of throw this out once in a while, and I get some looks. But I am a Harry Potter fan. Now, that was not like I was born and raised with it, but my kids were raised with it. And eventually, I listened to the books on tape when I had all that travel time before the day of pot, the days of podcasts, and I really fell for the series. I mean, I, I know more about Harry Potter than I'll bet you 99% of people my age. It's, we have in our house a Hogwarts room. It's my wife's kind of study um, and one of her uh, drafting boards for some of her artwork is in that room. And you look like you're in Hogwarts. She's been to Universal, I don't know how many times. I actually been there. I've been on the rides. I've been on the Green Gots ride. I get it. Anyway, 
I feel really bad for J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling was not invited to the 20th anniversary of whatever movie release it was, whether it was the first one, um, you know, or the last one. I don't know which one it is. And I was listening to Adam Carolla. Uh, I listened to his podcast a lot. If you if you like somebody that's got that dry sense of humor, you remember who Adam Carolla is. Uh, if not, you should look him up. Uh, he used to do a television show called The Man uh, The Man Show and several other things. But anyway. He has some great guests on, and they were talking about that J.K. Rowling is not invited to uh, this 20th anniversary thing. And, like, she's the writer. She's the creator. How could you not invite her? Well, apparently, her use of pronouns pissed somebody off. So, you know how I always say, I love you girls, I love you guys, I love you girls more? Apparently, just to be safe... I should wrap this up with, I love you, he, him, I love you, she, her, and of course, I love you, she, her, more. Does that, does that keep me safe? Because I've already been, I've already, I've already had a little cancel culture in my life this year. We sure don't need any more. Anyway, thanks. Hope you enjoy this episode. It's a very reminiscent, very, it, for me, it, it brought back a flood of memories, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I know you'll enjoy it. Of course you'll enjoy it. All right. Hey, hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. I am on the phone with Tom Davis, uh, and I'd say courtesy of one of my sponsors, Shooting Sportsman Magazine, one of my uh, thoughts when, when I got together with Shooting Sportsman was I've always read the magazine, and I wanted to be able to interview on occasion, you know, some of the writers. And Tom Davis is a long, long time. I mean, he's a long time that... Uh, I think, Tom, you're like the second oldest writer at Shooting Sportsman, let alone a few other magazines. Is that right? <laughs> That's probably the case, Ron. I think I started writing for Shooting Sportsman in maybe the fourth or fifth issue of the magazine. Right. So, so that's, that's been a while. That's been a while ago. Like 29 years worth a while, I think. Or something, something like that. Something I, like you that. You know, what, when did the magazine start? It did maybe, wow, I think, it's, I think it's longer than that. It had to start. Yeah, Gosh. it might it might be. I'm reading your profile just so you can be un you know you can be embarrassed. Um, you've been writing about gun dogs hunting, upland hunting, the sporting life for th more than 30 years. And his first work appeared in Shooting Sportsman Volume One, Issue Four. So it goes back a ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. I gotta start out because I, we're gonna get into the dogs and the hunting and, and the story you wrote uh, that I, I the, the public the public option story you wrote really spoke to me um, because it's like history repeating itself every year you know um, yeah I, and I just had that history repeat itself again a week ago so we, <laughs> we can talk about that. we'll 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 kill we'll kill those days to death here. Um, oh, when did you start writing? I mean, what, what came first, the hunting or the writing, or was it always a mix for you? What, what was the, the path? Oh, no, I, you know, I grew up a, a hunter. I mean, I grew up in western Iowa in the 1960s, and, you know, it was, you know, pheasant hunting was just ubiquitous then. Everybody hunted pheasants, and it was easy. Right. You know, I grew up in Sioux City, Iowa, and, and you could literally drive a mile out of town and, and find a place to hunt. Just I mean, like we that. had pheasants in my yard when I was growing up. I, you know, lived on the edge of town. We had pheasants in the backyard. I had a field back there where I could, I had an Irish setter. It was my first dog. And she was out of field stock on her father's side and show stock on her mother's side. And I don't have to tell you which side she took out. <laughs> well, she loved to run around. She loved to run around and hunt. And she had about as much pointing instinct as the average schnauzer. You know, so she loved <laughs> but, to run around. But she was she pretty. She had to be she pretty, loved though. To birds. <laughs> and yeah, she was beautiful. And, and chase them. But we literally could walk behind my house when I was a kid, when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, and find pheasants. And when I got a little older, I could, I could take my shotgun and walk six or seven blocks through town, carrying my shotgun, get to the one street, which was the border of the, you know, the incorporated city and the country, and I could be hunting. 
just like that. And that's the, you know, that's the milieu I grew up in. And, and the other thing, and you probably experienced this also in those days, if the, if the farm wasn't posted, the understanding was you could hunt it without asking permission first. It, it, if it was posted, you should seek out the landowner, knock on the door. Yeah. If it wasn't posted, you basically had carte blanche to hunt it. Occasionally, you know, you would run into a problem, but most of the time that was just sort of the implicit understanding between hunters and farmers. And over time that changed. It, but again, so I grew up in this culture where, you know, everybody hunted pheasants and it was, you know, this it was incredibly easy and accessible. This meeting is being recorded. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny, I as passionate as I am of a wing shooter, I started out in a city that you don't wing shoot in Chicago. So <laughs> I I grew up in eighty five hundred South Pulaski or between Pulaski and Kedzie in Chicago, but we had these two Huge, huge cemeteries. One was almost a section. And uh, that's kind of where we, like, I, we had pheasants. We actually trapped pheasants with long spring traps. There was still wow. original prairie. Like, this one cemetery was almost undeveloped. It only had, like, one row of graves in it. And it was just property. And so it had natural prairie grass. It had pheasants, fox, raccoon. So me and my buddies, we were just like an odd bunch. You know, we, instead of, breaking windows in cars, we were, you know, Ill, we, we, we were delinquents in the hunting world, right? We, yeah, we, delinquents, but in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. Like, all we were doing, we, we didn't have a hunting license. I know that for a fact because we weren't old enough to buy one. But a buddy of mine um, figured out if he glued, you know, in school you'd, you were bored and you had Elmer's, everybody had Elmer's glue in your desk, right, for all the projects. And, yeah. You know, if you're, like, I remember being bored in school, rubbing Elmer's glue on my hand, and it would dry kind of clear, you know. Then you'd peel it off and roll it up and put it in a big pen and, you know, make a spitball out of it. Well, my friend Ricky decided to glue corn to the trap plate and then put a little corn around there. And we were actually trying to find, we were trying to catch a squirrel, and we ended up catching a pheasant by the neck. And wow. we're like, wow, we... We're trappers now. We're pheasant hunters. But <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to kind of get adopted at 15 by a, a fellow who got me into skeet shooting, and another guy's dad took us hunting. So I, I'm from that era, but I'm so jealous that I grew up, you know, that I did not grow up where, like, we could wander the streets all day and night. Like, it was safe, but, you know, it was, we, we did, the railroad tracks and the, and the easements were about our only wilderness, you know. Right, right. Um, but, I mean, when I was in high school, you know, we could hunt, you know, I hunted waterfowl too. And sometimes we'd get up and go shoot, you know, ducks at dawn, drive to high school, still be in our waders. Oh. And, you know, it was, and I, I, I kind of think we used to even, you know, carry our case shotguns into school and put them in our lockers. Now that may be... A, a, you know, a, a mistake in memory, but I, you know, everybody knew that we had our guns in the trunks of our cars. Right. I mean, it was just no big deal. Right. It was not a threat. Right, right, right. You know? I, uh, I, I actually did, uh, in English class, I was a terrible student. I just did not focus in school at all, but I, I did my mandatory, you know, four years of high school. And my English teacher wanted us to do like a, like something that you're passionate about, like do a diorama and a demonstration and write something. And I decided to do it on trap shooting because I had a couple of years now under my belt. And uh, I actually brought my Remington 1100 into the school in a breakdown uh, Boyd case. I brought clay targets. I cut a shell down and glued it so you could see it. And I gave a whole talk about, you know, shotguns, shells, clay targets, how to hit them in, in Chicago, you know, like, I could see you guys bringing a gun there, right? That's, that doesn't even cause alarm. But it, in Chicago, that didn't even raise anybody's hackles, you know, at yeah. the same time. In, in the 70s, it was like, oh, well, right. he's going to bring Of course, he's not going to load it and shoot anybody. He's right. just going to. Yeah. But yeah. I always remember feeling kind of like I thought I was like the coolest because I was not a jock or anything. But I remember taking that gun out and sliding that barrel onto the receiver, which is just its own noise. It, 
Only an oh, 1100 yeah. sounds like an 1100, right? And then slipping right. that forearm on and that. And, and, oh, yeah. and the attention of the class was not, there was no fear. They were like, wow. You know, wow. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. And, you know, a couple yeah. of people wanted to hold it and I showed them how to shoulder. And the teacher's just sitting over there taking notes and probably catching up on, you know, grading papers while I'm up there yeah, blasting but, around. But, you know, that's, that's great. Yeah. It's interesting. You should, I don't know, did you ever uh, run across or remember or hear the name Vic Rinders? Yeah, He's somewhere. Legendary, legendary trap shooter from uh, yeah. Waukesha, Wisconsin, okay. suburb of uh, suburb of Milwaukee. The only reason I bring it up is I just did a, I write for a magazine called Our Wisconsin, which is just a general interest Wisconsin magazine. But I do a column on you know outdoor recreation, and you know it's a pretty pretty broad brief that I have. To, do stuff that I want. Yeah. So I did a column on this guy, Vic Reinders, who's, you know, he's been dead for 20 some years now, but he was an absolutely legendary trap shooter. He was the first trap shooter to maintain a 98% average for a hundred thousand targets. <laughs> and then he maintained it for another 40,000. Wow. <laughs> he hit his, his record was 515 straight. Oh, my God. As a friend of mine said, I couldn't break 515 straight with a hammer. <laughs> yeah, at some point, <laughs> you'd still miss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. He was amazing. And there was a one little story. So, you know, later in his life, he shot, I and mean, he kept shooting. And basically, you know, he died at the age of 90 and was shooting, you know, almost to the end. Well, later in life, he was trap shooting on a cold day. At his, his Waukesha Gun Club, which was the famous venue that he had helped found back in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And he started to cramp up, you know, his legs. And so his, his friends, everybody knew him. They kind of picked him up and they bundled him back into the clubhouse. And as they were doing that, something fell out of his jacket pocket. You know what it was? Mm -mm. It was a baked potato. <laughs> he would bake a potato and put it in his jacket pocket when he shot on cold days. <laughs> a hand, hand warmer. Warm. Hand warmer. And then, he, and then when he was done shooting, he'd eat the potato. <laughs> yeah, they just don't make anyway, anybody. That was, that was Vic Reiner. Oh, you can't make but that stuff circling up. Circling back to your original question, yeah, I was, I was always a hunter, and the writing came, came later. Yeah, yeah. Did you – I tried to write one time. You know, I actually tried to submit an article – after doing a sage grouse hunt once, and boy, I thought I thought well, this isn't that hard to do, <laughs> you know. And I literally sent it to every magazine and every, you know, never heard back from anybody. And, and a good friend of mine's a writer, so he said he says, "Well, that's what being a writer is. You get rejected." I said, "Well, I don't even know if right. I was I don't even know if I was rejected. I I got a feeling I they just, you know, somebody had to like that story." And then years later, or a couple, a few years later. I was interviewing Ben Williams out at his place in Montana. Sure. And what a great guy. I, oh, he's one of the, he's another one of those legends out there. Oh, yeah, he's a legend. I mean, he is, if, if there is a, a wing shooting legend yeah. in his own time, it's Ben Williams. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I had a copy of, of the article I wrote, and he's looking at it, and he's, yeah, that's a good story, but. You can't use the word I that many times, Ron. You know, it was, <laughs> then I did this, and then I did this, and then I got the dog. And then I, he's, he's like, this is terrible. <laughs> he's a, it's a good story, but you can't write. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> screw it. That was my one attempt. How, how did you start writing? Because I find it interesting. You know, I mean, well, it. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'd always done a lot of writing in college. I majored in philosophy which, you know, requires a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and my professors had always kind of complimented me on the quality of my, my stuff. They said, you know, it's, 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 it's enjoyable to read your essays. And I thought, well, that's cool. And then I went to graduate school and did more writing and sort of got the same compliments. And the, the, to make a long story as short as I can, uh, I was sort of out of work, basically, <laughs> <laughs> and had, oh, you know, it's sort of been toying with this idea of trying to do some, some writing, and there were a couple things that, 
that that inspired me. One was I started to read uh, Gray's Sporting Journal, which was always very literary. It was a kind of a different kind of writing that really yeah. attracted me. And so that was an inspiration. That was, it would have been in the late 70s, early 80s. And then in the 80s was also when Gundog Magazine mm-hmm. first started. Yeah. And when Gundog Magazine first started, they really had an incredible array of writing talent on their masthead. Um, you know, they had Charlie Waterman, who was just a fabulous writer, um, Gene Hill, Michael McIntosh, uh, Steve Smith was there for a while, uh, Richard Walters, just a bunch of really good writers. And so I thought, you know, it'd be cool. And plus that was the beginning of these more niche specialty magazines. So in Gundog really spoke to that, that niche and that. I was I was at the time I, uh, you know, had my first couple of English setters, which were the dogs I sort of started out with. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyway, I started to write some stuff and just you know do what you have to do, which is send it out cold to editors, and you know got plenty of rejections, <laughs> and eventually started to sell a few things. And when you do sell a few things and you find some editors who who like the way you write then you get assigned to do some stuff and so it just it just gradually you know evolved ron yeah um i can't really point to one big break you know you get it all of a sudden you sell something to gundam and then you sell something to gray sporting journal and then you sell something to shooting sportsman or whatever and and then the more cred you're able to amass the easier it becomes right know, right <clears throat> I, and I imagine some of them editors even are familiar with each other too, and then your your name oh, yeah. gets your name gets passed around oh, like sure. like oh yeah oh, I got sure. a great article. It'd be kind of funny though to get your first article that they didn't read or that they didn't reject and send it to them like ten years later like great article Tom great article. No, I, 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 that has happened, Ron, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was a story that I sent to a magazine that I worked with and. It came back, and the editor editor turned it down. And I was, you know, by then I had enough confidence to know that it was a good story. Yeah, yeah. So I was a little surprised by that. And it was also the story that was perfect for this magazine. So I sort of let it rest for a little while. And mm-hmm. in the meantime, I sent it to a, a friend of mine who was familiar with the magazine. He said, they turned this down? What, are they crazy? He said, let me see what I can do. So he sort of did a did a sideways sort of an end run on the deal and sent it to somebody who, like the publisher, who was like one step above the editor. <laughs> said, this is a story from my friend Tom Davis that I think would be great for your magazine. You might, mind, you might want to show it to the editor uh, and see what he thinks. <laughs> so he did, and the editor came back to me and said, boy, I really like this. I'm going to run it. <laughs> And he's, now he, he, he claimed that he had no knowledge of having read it before, but I find that a little hard to believe. In any event, all's well that ends well. Yeah. I got published, and it was a good story. So, so you just basically, you, you, you turned into one, right? You just turned into an outdoor outdoor lifestyle, kind outdoor of, yeah, writer. It just, yeah. kind, it just kind of happened. There was never any big plan. Right, right. You didn't come yeah, out of college people going. Say, people say, well, how did you become a writer? And I say, because I was even worse at everything else. <laughs> yeah, but that's like the musician. Yeah, because I can't sing or dance, right? Yeah. yeah right, right. Uh, exactly. so going back to your, the, the Irish, how did you end up with an Irish setter? I mean, they were more popular back then, but was that a... Well, uh, not, uh, I mean, not so much. The reason I, my first thought was an Irish setter, and the, the reason for that is because my sixth grade teacher had given me the Jim Kjellgaard Big Red books. Mm. So there was a trilogy. There was Big Red, Irish Red, and Outlaw Red. And I, I, and I devoured them all, and at that point, I was like, I have to have an Irish set. <laughs> and, you know, and this, was, this would have been the late 1960s. You know, I was, like I said, maybe 12 years old. Right. And, you know, these days, it's it's pretty easy to find good hunting Irish setters, or some of them prefer to call them red setters. Right, right. 
Uh, but back then it was pretty tough. And as I, as I mentioned before, we finally found a guy locally who had a show bred Irish setter that he'd bred to a field bred Irish setter who had, you know, good, good hunting yeah. credentials, but my dog yeah. took after the show side and, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun together and I took her out and, and, you know, ran her all the time. And, you know, I think she pointed one bird in her entire life, which happened to be a quail, <laughs> a single quail. Um, and then gradually I sort of started getting interested in English setters. And when I went off to college, I had to give my Irish setter away because I went out of state. Yeah. You know, was My parents weren't in a position to take care of her. So after that, after I graduated and and kind of got my feet under me, I got uh, an English couple of English setters. Um, you, you didn't do the was, the brother sister thing, did you? you? Did you didn't take two from the same litter, did you? No, no, I didn't do that. Okay. My first dog was a male, and he was a beautiful black and white. He was a gorgeous dog. I called him Zach. He was sired by Tomoka, who was a very famous oh, yeah. English setter, and his dam was out of another very famous English setter called Grouse Ridge Will. So he was really well bred, and he was a pretty hard headed dog. He was a lot of dog for a guy like me, but God, he was a bird finder. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a bird finder. You, you could, and you could once find he other. Found them, <laughs> once he found them, he knew what to do with them, and he would wait for you. So I was, you know, even hunting at the time when I first really started hunting with them is when I moved to, to northern Wisconsin and uh, was hunting grouse and woodcock for the first time after hunting pheasants and, and quail. Yeah. And, and boy, you know, I put a bell on him, and even so, it could be a real struggle to find him. Thankfully, that was when the first beeper collars appeared on the market, and the beeper collar totally revolutionized <laughs> grouse and woodcock cutting for me with Zach. With that dog. Because <laughs> right. it was, cause I could find it. And he would, because he would basically just keep going until he found a bird to find. And, right. You know, some of the places where he ended up awfully rugged. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, the dog, the dog lacked what we call cooperation in the field, but... He, yeah, had all the, he had all the my, talent. He had all the great talent. He just, yeah, he, he wasn't, he was not a, a great handling dog. Um, but, I mean, it's funny. My friend, a, a very good hunting buddy, Terry Barker, he's a, he's a retired now veterinarian locally. And we our, our, our enduring memory of hunting grouse and woodcock with Zach is, let's, you know, it's the end of the day. You've been busting the cover all day long. And, you know, right about, you know, you're thinking about, you know, pulling the plug and, you, and, you know, you're thinking about a cold beer or a glass of bourbon or something. And that's about when you hear Zach's beeper about half a mile away across a swamp, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's like, oh, crap, you know, and then you had to go find him. But, you know, in memory at the time, you're thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe he's on point over over, over there, there. But yeah. In, in memory, and there's a great memory. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a, I had a dog that was in similar, you know, had all the, t and I wasn't much of a trainer. Never, you know, I've trained a few dogs, but I've had the same thing where it's like, I was always going for a hunt with my dog. He wasn't necessarily going with me, you know. Yeah. But if I could endure it, you know, he's going to hold the right. point and and a hell of a retriever, a hell of a tracker. I mean, yeah. I would see people. With that dog, I would see people look, you know, you can always tell when someone's looking for a down bird, right? They're, you know, everyone's, you know, looking like they're lost a contact lens, right? And you hear them like, come on, dead bird. Dead. You're here. I, I have literally stopped a couple times and said, you mind if I try? And this dog, you know, I'm not saying he never lost a bird because nobody could say that. But he's a dog that you could take over to another spot that he didn't even hunt. He had such a drive to find something that was, that he could put in his mouth, you know. Yeah, isn't that? I mean, it's yeah. it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal when you find a dog like that. But he wouldn't and, come when know. I call him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like, hey, it's a he's like, I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so what what did you get after no, that? You got you got a female then after that. Yeah, then I got a female, and I sort of dabbled around in field trials with her, and 
and you know, not very successfully. I had her with a professional trainer for a while and, you know, horseback stuff. And, you know, she was really not talented enough to, to, to compete at that level, but I've, you know, had some great memories of, of, you know, of her and of that time in my life. And, and just went on from there and had mostly English setters, a couple of pointers. You know, as I told you, I had the one uh, pointer that I gave to my friend Bubba Wood in Texas. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that, that, that article's great. Which was, you know, <laughs> was, she was a phenomenally talented dog. But as we had, you and I had discussed, you know, sometimes a dog is just not the right dog for you. And yeah. For, and for the way you hunt or for where you hunt or whatever. And, you know, she wasn't the right dog for me, but she was the perfect dog for Bubba, who had a, you know, hunting in West Texas and big country and, you know, where you need a lot of dog, it covers a lot of ground. Yeah. And yeah. She was phenomenal for him. So. So and now I've got an old man. Now I've got an old man's dog, an English cock. <laughs> well, I, that's that was the other reason I said when I uh, wrote to to uh, Ralph and I said I need Tom's email address because I went. You know, I've had pointing dogs. Mostly short hairs, wire hairs, and now I've got these really goofy Italian Broncos. But uh, I, enough of you writers out there wrote, keep writing these stories about the English Cocker. And they, like, maybe five, seven years ago, maybe you could clear me up on it. It seemed like, you, you know, I get a subscription to every magazine just because I like doing it, you know, when it's a snowy day. And I keep writing, reading articles about, English cockers, English cockers. Eng and then I interviewed a guy from England about him. And I'm like, this dog cannot be that good. It just cannot be that lovable. <laughs> and then he, he helped me find a, a breeder down in Georgia, and it was bred with his dog. And now I've got one. She's three years old. And uh -huh. so how did you find the cocker in your life? Was it? Did... Well, I've been interested in them, Ron, you know, really <laughs> from the beginning. Um, I have a friend in North Dakota named Tom Ness, who's a, a long time. He was one of the first kind of cocker guys okay. in the United States. He's a professional trainer and a breeder. Mm -hmm. And he's actually, as he never fails to remind me, a couple of years ago, he was voted into the Cocker Field Trial Hall of Fame. So okay. every, time I, every time I call him, he says, now, Davis... Don't forget you're talking to a Hall of Famer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I had gone out and hunted with him. Oh, gosh. Maybe in the, like, 1997 mm -hmm. or something like that. And we hunted Snipe with Cockers, wow. which was an absolute blast. I mean, you know, you know, don't ask me how many Snipe we killed because it wasn't very many, but we sure burned a lot of powder. <laughs> and these cockers are just zigging around, and then we you know, even hunted ducks a little bit. With them. So it was just great fun. And I've always liked them. I've attended the uh, the National Cocker uh, Field Trial Championships on a couple of occasions, which is a lot of fun because it's one of the few field trials, you know, you can actually walk along right. with the gallop. Yeah. At a spaniel trial and see what's going on. Right. You know, which makes it, you know, a lot more sort of spectator friendly sure. than most other field forms of field trials. Right. So and I'd got, you know, and then I'd hunted, you know, over other dogs and I just really liked them. But I and, and I've been threatening to get one for years. And I just was never able to kind of get over the hump because I still had the pointing dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in a situation where Keeping two dogs was about the max for me. I live, I live in the, in the city. I may mean, live in a suburb of, of Green Bay. And anyway, um, my last English setter, Tina, who was a phenomenal dog, was sort of winding down. And I knew it, you know, and I just, for a variety of reasons, decided that it was really time to, to look hard at getting a cocker. And I put out uh, some feelers, and I just, you know, got insanely lucky and found um, a couple, Kim and Beth Ann Wiley in Stillwater, Minnesota, who are professional cocker uh, trainers and breeders. And they had this dog who they put a field champion title on, uh, but they'd retired her from competition and they weren't going to try to breed her because she almost never came into season. Right. 
So the long and short of it is they were looking to place her in a good hunting home, and I was just in the right place at the right time. Gotcha. So that's how I got Rumor, who's behind me in a, in a crate. She's she's always was a kennel dog, so she's very happy to be in a crate in the house, but if you let her out, she's just bouncing off the walls. Right, right. So, you know, she's a cocker, and I think it's, it's, it's you know, as I say about cockers, impulse control can be a real problem right, with that. Right, right. Yeah, I, so, I have... Uh, she's absolutely fine in her crate, and I let her out. We, we go for several walks every day, and she's just great. And she's great fun to hunt with. You know, as I say, she's very low maintenance to hunt with. Yeah. But she's a little bit of high maintenance to live with. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think I could bring Taffy into the house. She's a kennel dog, but she, yeah. when I'm in my other home, she has run of the house. She has run of the kennel. Um, but she has no, when it comes to impulse control, I really was so enamored with her that, I mean, here's a dog that you just go and runs to your feet. Just like, what? What do you need? And stares you right in the eyes. Like with Absolutely. this, like this Absolutely. look, like yep. my, my kids never looked that sweet to me in, in my eyes. And Ever. so I let her, all I would do is sit in here with a tennis ball and bounce it off the far wall, and she'd pick it up and bring it back, pick it up, bring it back, pick. And, you know, all I was doing was no commands, no, no, no structure, and she just like, this is the best guy in the whole world. He, he doesn't care what I do. I mean, if she had her own, I've, I've had to scold. She will jump on any table, any couch. You can't really bring her to another person's house because she would jump no. on your kit. She would jump right in your kitchen table. Now I know I could have trained her, you know, off and no, right. but she right. kind of lived like a little hooligan out here. And yeah. at, at three years of age, she has, you know, she's great in the field. I, I've never seen a dog retrieve with any more zeal, and I've had some that good would, retrieving yeah, dogs. Room, my dog Rumor is the same way. I mean, she just she retrieves like she's been shot from a cannon. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, Pete, I, I was I stayed back on a hunt in Kansas last year. I didn't bring her out because it was a it was a it was a big group hunt in, on some on some tall switchgrass. And the yeah. one other fella that had a cocker actually had a little like a dune buggy flag on a harness. Like he put a, a hunting vest on her and he had a yeah. pu- and he had like a little yeah. flag so he could kind of see. See where she was at. No, that's that's not the dumbest idea I've ever I, heard. I, I, I had agree with the guy because I'm like, I'll never see her in this grass. We got big dogs and labs and everything. And yeah. So anyway, she sat out. But when when they left, I said, I'm just going to, you know, I, I didn't even, I think I shot one bird, you know. And uh, I told him, I'm going to stay back. I said, I'm going to run Taffy here. And they said, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And, uh, of course, I had, there was some sorghum strips that were cut into this place. And, um I was just sitting there parking there having a cigar and looking down the row and I see a couple roosters start to poke their head back out after everybody <laughs> left. I'm like, I'm like, let's take her down there. You know, and she went, I mean, it's like with no, almost with no training. She just, I mean, she just drove that bird out of the grass. I made a good shot on it. It was a long shot. And that dog, I swear was almost to the bird by the time the bird hit the ground and back to me oh. just, and back to me yeah. almost as fast. I, yeah. I, I, that was the first time I saw her retrieve a pheasant, and she weighs 23 pounds. You know? Right. And, well, that's, oh. I mean, the great thing about cockers is that they do all this so natural. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. you know, they're a distant dog, but if you, if you give them a little bit of basic obedience training, mm-hmm. the average guy should be able to take them out and go hunting and be successful. Right, right. If if there's a bird there, they're going to make it come up. You know. They're, oh, there. Yeah. It's, they're, yeah. Exactly. And they're going. If it goes down, they're going to find it, and uh, and they're happy, and they're in You know, they're just little dynamos. Right. Right. Yeah. I I told my wife. I said, well, it's just a matter of time. I said there'll be another one in here. Pretty. She doesn't care how many dogs I have out in the kennel, because I like I have to have a cocker now for forever. Yeah. And like if I yeah. like she's laying right here. Joe, she's just sleeping right now. But if I turn the chair and if I look at her, because I guarantee she's looking at me somehow, even when she sleeps on a bed in a red roof in with me, you know, <laughs> I kind of get up and I look and she's staring at me. I'm like, what? Yep. Don't you sleep? 
know? Well, that's the thing. Oh, yeah, my God. We're just staring you down all the time. It's amazing. I, I hate incredible. to drive the popularity of them up, but, I mean, yeah, if you if I could Yeah, and, you know, that's the thing. I mean, you know, popularity is such a double-edged sword. It is. In a, in a sporting breed because once it, a, a, a breed becomes popular, you know, they, they, people are incentivized just to sure. produce – produce puppies regardless of their quality mm -hmm. and so far the cockers have been pretty good now you know i've heard that you know there are some rumblings and grumblings about some breeders i mean in, but by and large you know there's you know pretty darn good yeah i'd probably be like getting a german short hair in the 80s you probably got a hunting dog you know yeah. probably got oh, yeah. and it probably looked something like a german short hair should look like Right. And then somehow, and 20 years later, I've seen 32-pound short hairs out there. And I'm like, what? really? <laughs> oh, my God. In uh, I, have, I, have uh, an, I mean, uh, I've certainly seen some short hairs that, that make you wonder if, if the little pointer didn't oh, sneak in. Oh, that, that too. That too. <laughs> sneak into the, you know, through the back door somewhere. But, I, I um, think maybe. I haven't seen any quite that small. I've seen some short hairs that I suppose would be maybe mid-40s, but I've never right. seen one that small. Oh, I, this lady had a couple of them in Florida. And I, and I thought she had a couple of puppies, you know. I thought yeah. they, she goes, no, that's uh, he's he's three and she's two, and I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? Who bred that? You know. But right. hopefully, hopefully, cockers don't get any bigger and they keep staring you in the face. Cause... I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think they're going to let them get any bigger. I certainly hope not. Yeah, they're perfect. That's one of the reasons that they're nice. Is that you know, if you need to pick them up, you can pick them up in one arm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I... yeah. They're portable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Tom, the story you wrote, the public option, uh, it, it it just brings back, like, I think just because, you know, there's it's great. There's so many more young people out there, right? There's so many young people that are getting into hunting that didn't have, you know, your bringing up or even my bringing up in the, in the city. And they, you know, <clears throat> they didn't have uh, ABC's Wide World Sports on and Bing Crosby on Sunday. Bing, and, Bing Crosby and Phil Harris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and those were kind of the things that got me. You know, I'd see that on television. That was like, oh, sure. bam, you know. But oh, yeah. um, the stories you write, it's like the story. Now it, I'm taking it because rumors in this story. So this story is probably from last season, I'm guessing. Yeah. But this story could have been a story from 20 years ago. You know, <laughs> it's it's like you're expecting all this great stuff. It's like you got to set your expectation bar. But no matter what, as long as you've been in the game, you're like, this is it. This is oh, the spot. That's right. We're I mean, going to get the right. birds. I mean, <laughs> it just if, doesn't happen. If, if, if success was assured, why would you want to do it? Right. You know, right. I mean, there's got to be that there has to be the challenge. There has to be the element of chance, the element of surprise, the element of the unexpected. I mean, those are all, you know, parts of the, the big picture. Right. I, uh, I had a fellow. One of the people who, on my podcast, we have what's called a, a Patreon account. And there's a lot of these people, and I give them a little extra content. I give them discounts on some of my products that are my sponsor's products. And we have a Zoom room. And this young guy, Bryce, was on last night. And he, f he got an invite all through the Internet, like never met these people, but to go chucker hunting in Hell's Canyon. <laughs> and, oh wow! And like that's something like you and I could have never done. There was no internet. There was no you didn't you didn't bump into somebody on right. Facebook and say, "Hey, fly out and hunt with us," you know. So right. it's kind of cool. His path is different, but his story was just like this. He went all the way to Utah, and he got one chucker. <laughs> you know? that sounds about that sounds so, about right. One one stinking chucker all the way to sounds Utah. About right. But uh, yeah, I mean, I. I the only time I was in really in chucker country was, oh gosh, it was probably eight or nine years ago. And I'd gone out to Idaho at the, at the invitation of some people I, I know. I mean, you may know, have you ever heard of Dr. Sean Waymont? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I interviewed him. A bird dog, yep. bird dog guy. Yep. Yep. Anyway, he and his brother, Sean lives in Colorado and his brother still lives in Idaho and They'd been talking up the hunting in, in Idaho, so I made the long drive from Ooh. Green Bay out to Idaho. And it was in, in early, it was early October, and believe it or not, I was driving across Nebraska and ran smack into a blizzard <laughs> in like 
you know, the first week in October, which is crazy, and had to spend the night in Valentine, Nebraska, and was late getting there. Well, the long and short of it is that was the only time I've been anywhere near a chucker. And Sean was up, and he flushed a covey, and he'd seen they'd flown across a canyon up into a little shallow flat with some sage bushes. And he's, he came back, and he said, he pointed to me exactly where they, he saw them go down. So I had my setter, Tina, and we worked our way up there, and she pointed in exactly the spot that he said he'd, he'd seen them land. But as chuckers do, they'd run off. Right. And we never could catch up to them. So that was my one and that was my one and really only chance to, to get on a chucker. And I have at this point I'm just too damn old. Well, <laughs> yeah, my knee's not good enough and my 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 desire is more for uh, hunting with your four buddies in Iowa, you know. To yeah. take take what comes, you know, it, it well, and then, that's and that's the you know, basically these are the same guys that I hunt grouse and woodcock with in wisconsin and we have the same philosophy you know, yeah. we, go, we go out and you know most days we get something and some days we get nothing right but we have a great time and then we come back to the cabin and we have some bourbon and you know have something good to eat and and then it became one of the best days ever right it exactly just, it doesn't exactly. matter exactly it's just all it's just all part of the the ongoing so we say it's the ongoing saga, the hard life of the sports. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, you know, it's like fishermen. It's like fishermen kind of catch a lot. I mean, a good fisherman catches a lot of fish. I get, you know, the ones I talk to. I think they do. Or they have to let them go. And I think they're crazy. I'm not a fisherman, though. You know, I, I, I find it, like, impossible to st- – like if I go fishing, there better be something on my line pretty quick. But I, <laughs> but if I go hunting, I I was out. So you in, don't mind? You don't? It's it's catching fish is okay. It's the fishing the, part. The, yes, exactly. You like to catch fish. I'm fishing a, is not. There needs not to so be great. another pronoun, another noun to describe a fisherman who yeah, only something. likes to catch fish. Right. But bird hunting, um, you know, I walked the last day in North Dakota. Walked, had all these different opportunities, all these different misses, and finally, I literally. I was on this one little last push, and I'm like, I, I, I really would like to get a bird. You know, I really don't want to get skunked today. But the people I was with were great, you know. And, uh, and we had, I think we had one bird in the bag. And sure enough, I, I literally, I, I'm not a religious guy, but I was like, come on, you know, just <laughs> could, could you give me one today, you know. And sure <laughs> enough, walking back to the truck. Dog goes on point, rooster flies up, boom, hit it, rolls across the road, dog gets it. And it was like, best day ever. But it was yep. hours and hours you know, one, of, frust- I mean, that's of frustration. You know, <laughs> you know the, the, that, that difference or that distance from zero birds to one bird is yeah. almost infinite. Yeah, <laughs> it almost makes me understand makes soccer. You know, it almost makes oh, me God. understand yes. soccer, right? Oh. They play yeah. all that tame, and the score oh. is what? One to zero. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? right. But anyway. Exactly. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, that story you wrote, it just sounds like – I, I highlighted a couple things, and, and I want people – I don't know if everybody, you know, not all my listeners get it, although I will give Shooting Sportsman a nice plug because they gave my listeners a nice discount for their first year to become a member. Yeah to start reading it. But one of the things I highlighted, and this just reminds me, like I've got a group that I go with, uh, not all the same all the time, but at least one or two of the same guys. And one of the things you wrote was, by the end, the pity party was in full swing. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, we laid in a supply of high test bourbon at the cabin we were renting, along with wine, beer, and Advil. Well, and said's. Uh, allowing yeah. us to attack our pain from multiple angles. I, that, that I highlighted that. I was like, I've been there so many times, and I could find myself having a little pity party for myself. Oh, yeah. yeah it's I mean, unbelievable. If you, if you've, yeah, if you've got, you know, enough miles under your belt chasing birds, you've been there. Right, right. And it's almost like, but you already know you signed up for this. Yeah. But every time you walk, and then there are those days that, you could do no wrong, you know, yeah. and, that, and, and oh, then, yeah. then there's the days that you, you can't hit a bird. Your barrel's bent. Like, oh, I know. In, in your article, no. you wrote, 
Now, I don't know why anybody would still have a barrel selector where you could be in neutral like yours is. <laughs> well, I don't know what you're thinking. That's, that's, the, <laughs> fatal, that's the fatal flaw of the Browning Super I, I I'm surprised that's your gun of choice, honestly. Well, yeah, that's, well, that's what, it's what I had, you know. So. Yeah. It's, Somebody, a friend of mine read that, and he laughed. He said he's got one, and what he does, because he always has it, you know, selected for the bottom barrel first, mm -hmm. he just puts a slab of duct tape so that thing cannot move back right. to that to that no man's land position. Right. Yeah, I, I can't remember what gun it was. I think it was a, an early CZ I had or something. Same thing. And I, I'm kind of a weird, like, I kind of always are checking my safety. I don't know why. But oh, I, I do too. And, and, I, and that gets me in trouble with that neutral, you know. Yep. And yep. It, it's like it was so unnecessary because I don't know anybody. Well, I like two trigger guns, so you don't need a barrel selector. Your right. barrel selector's in the trigger. But even at that problem, I still pull the front trigger first every time. I don't have the brain power to go, oh, farther shot, back trigger. Right, uh -huh. no more than I want to think about left barrel, right barrel, left barrel, right, right. you know, or top barrel, right. bottom barrel, you know. So yeah. what? What's your? Is that uh, is that just an heirloom gun or something you've been shooting for a long time? Oh, it's something I picked up. I mean, I've always I, I found it at a really good price, at, you know, years ago at a gun shop, and uh, I've you know I've made some some pretty remarkable shots with it, and and actually. This year, I, what I, I did pick up a new uh, over and under at one of those uh, Savage Stevens 555, mm -hmm. you know, which is a, you know made in Turkey. Yep. Uh, relatively inexpensive but light. Yeah. And, and you know, easy to carry. And I got the 555E, which is what they call enhanced. Has a little bit of laser engraving and and you know automatic ejectors, screw and chokes. And it has a definite, you know, barrel selector, so there is no in-between. <laughs> no neutral. Position. No neutral. So I carried that this year, and, you know, the first couple of days I thought it was magic. And, you know, the second couple of days I would have paid you to take it off my hands. You know, it's just one of those deals, you know. So right. Yeah, there's... there's... Someday, like you said, some days you can't miss, and some days it's like you can't hit your backside with either hand and what? it's so funny you know when you've making the mistake too it's like you just know it like all of a yeah, sudden sometimes but sometimes you don't i mean it was weird the last day this year i was hunting and, and the problem the the you know the, the issue the last day we were out there and this was in northern iowa the wind was just screaming yeah and and even if the, the bird would get up and try to fight the wind they were sort of getting pushed back and forth. So you it's like you could never get a good beat on the darn bird. Right, right. You know, and then you'd pull the trigger and you'd miss. And then by that point, you'd be 50 yards away with the wind at its back. And then you were toast. Right. But you still pull the other trigger. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, are you, you, miss, you miss 100% of the shots <laughs> yeah, you don't you take. To, you have to do right. that. I know. <laughs> but I, I, I've had... I've had, I, I'm in the same exact, I think everybody, I think most everybody is. There's days when you kind of almost look at your friends and go like, you, you crack the barrel open. You're like, yeah, I got that one, you know. And there's days when you're just like, come on, come on. Did, did somebody oh, yeah. give me like a weighted blank? Like somehow, a weight, you gave me a box of weighted blanks because the, the bird I will miss yeah. all the time is that bird that's pointed. Look at a three foot long tail on a rooster. And lose my shit. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, the word, I mean, the hardest shot is a straightaway, I think. A I, dead straightaway is the hardest shot. I, 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 I flub it, I flub it regularly, you know. Yeah, and in Gene Hill, as Gene Hill said, there are no easy shots, and he was right. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's, it's all your head. It's, you got to just be. Well, it's like, I always say it's, it's, it's like, you know, Yogi Berra's great line. You know, it's, it's, it's 90% metal. The other half is physical. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. I like that one. So is your, is your season, your, are you, do you hit Iowa more than Wisconsin, more than the grouse woods? You, or... Oh, no. I, my, you know, my big thing now these days is, is, you know, is Wisconsin. Is it? So, and that's, that's, you know, 
I may sneak out after deer season and, and try to scare up a grouse, but you know, mm -hmm. October is when I hit it, yeah. hit it really hard. Yeah. And uh, then there's usually one trip to Iowa. Um, I was hoping this year to get out to, to the Dakotas for a prairie grouse, but the drought really hammered uh, the, where you were going. Um, yeah. Um, South Dakota, North Dakota uh, really got, you know, they were just, the, they were good birds in the spring. The, the counts on the left, the dancing grounds were yeah. really good, but there was just no recruitment. I mean, nesting was just non-existent because it's yeah. so damn dry. I, I've but, heard uh, that, but I've heard a lot of people somehow got through that. Like they would find that. Yeah, it's, I've, I've gotten a lot of sort of, I don't want to say conflicting reports, but yeah. some guys say they walked forever to get one bird, and other guys said that if they could find any kind of decent grass, it was they easy. did okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's the old thing. You pay your money, you take your chances. Right. Do you, do you still have some uh, contacts on private land out from your, uh, your uh, homestead area? I really don't. I mean, I still have um, a... a retired farm family that I'm very close to, but you know, their land, they rent their land and it's pretty much all in crops. Right. And you know, the time was you know, during the heyday of the CRP uh, program in the eighties and nineties, um, you know, there was a lot of land out there that was the CRP and they yeah. had a lot of, you know, friends and neighbors who, who they could just call and say, hey, is it okay if our friends from Wisconsin Hunt your CRP. And more often than not, to be sure. Yeah. Out. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of things have happened, Ron. Um, you know, mo most of the CRP stuff has expired, and there just isn't, a, there just isn't, and I allude to this in that, in this public option, the story you've been referencing, you know, there just isn't as much cover on private land anymore. Right, right. And the, the, the proportion has really changed. You know, years ago, Virtually all the cover was in a state like Iowa, which doesn't have a lot of public land. Virtually all the cover was on private land. Right. Now that balance has changed, and most places, more of the cover is going to be on public land if right. there is any public land. And then there's also the, you know they've got a they've got a private land access program. I mean, it's basically you know. Iowa's walk-in program, which right. is called IHAP, which all the dozen states have. Yeah, oh, know, yeah, yeah. South Dakota has one, North, North Dakota, Dakota Nebraska, Kansas. Kansas. Yep. They all have an, a walk-in, and Iowa has that, and they do a great job. And as I say, you know, they do a great job with the stuff that's under their control, but, you know, so much is out of your control when that's what you right. have to hunt. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, if you still had permission on every piece of property you hunted as a kid— they're just, it's oh. just, just, it wouldn't even matter because those farms are not farmed the same way. Yeah. They're not, yeah. They're not farmed the same way. And, 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 and the ownership is so different now. I mean, a lot of times they're farmed, they're owned by people, or if they're even owned by people, they may be owned by a hedge fund right. somewhere. Right. Right. And who they, and they hire a guy to farm it for them. So you may not even be able to find someone who's in a position to give you permission right um that having been said i mean where there is cover on private land you're still gonna do really well there I and mean, i when i was in iowa uh one of the guys in our group got on some private he had an in with a local friend and he hunted with this guy on private land and you know, got his three roosters, and I said, well, how many birds did you see over the course of, he just hunted in the morning. Yeah. I said, how many birds did you see? He said, probably 40. Wow. You know, <laughs> not all roosters, but 40 birds yeah. total. Yeah. And that was more birds than I saw in four days hunting <laughs> exclusively public land. Right, so, right. You know, so there's still that dichotomy there. But what do you do? Yeah. You just keep going for another season. You keep, you, you keep going. <laughs> What's the, uh, who, who's been hunting with, as far as buddies go? You said this group is a, a friend of yours, or, or all friends you've been hunting for a long time. What's, who's got the record of hunting the longest with you? Any, any one particular fella? Oh, man. Um, well, 
Terry Barker, my veterinarian buddy, he's probably, when I moved to Wisconsin in 1982, I think I probably hunted with him for the first time in about 1983. So he and I have been hunting together right. for close to 40 years. And he grew up, he grew up on a farm in uh, central Iowa. And when we first hunted together, his parents still had the farm. Mm. They'd go down there and hunt pheasants and quail. And of course, the same deal. They had they knew people that had cover, and we could hunt their farms too. Yeah, so yeah. That was the thing. That Do was you... the thing. So he and I have hunted for, for close to forty years. I've got maybe three other real good hunting buddies that I met in the late night late eighties. So we've been hunting together for thirty plus years. Yeah. We've, we've had the same group of guys that go up and hunt together for grouse and woodcock. Um, for over over well over thirty years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something that I. It, it's when I'm with those kind of friends, it just really can't be a bad trip. It's just no. like my best friend, the the one that's hunted with me the longest. You know, we we were next door neighbors, so we don't really know. You know, we were five years old when we met. You know. Yeah. So and, there was never a time when you didn't know one another. Right. Basically. Right. And. And the two of us will argue like a married couple while we're, you know, on a hunt. And it's and like a couple, you know, there's always somebody that may be new to the group or uh, like a friend of mine does my website and my neighbor is with on a hunt. And they really thought that me and Roof were mad at each other. And, it, it, <laughs> and we're just, this is just how we converse. You know, we just, yeah. that's the way our dads yeah. converse. That's the way well, we you're converse. Couple, you're a couple Chicago kids too, right, right. so. You it's kind of like, just, that's like just hey, normal. hey, hey, yeah, <laughs> right, know? right. And and people get like a little <laughs> like, oh man, it's gonna be a bad day. And then the next minute, we're like, you ready to go? Oh yeah, let's go. Hey, let me go back and get something out of my room, and I'll go right back. I'm like, can't you ever be ready? Like, do you ever have? <laughs> do, do you have any? Do you have that one friend that's always like one step off of everybody else? Because <laughs> I, I mean. There's always one. Well, like, we have one, one of our guys, one of our guys, who's, who's a great guy. His name is Eric Forrester, and he's an attorney. And, and the problem with Eric is if you run into any other groups of guys, it's like you better pull him away because if not, he'll start asking questions about <laughs> this, that, and the other thing. Like, where have you been hunting? What kind of dogs do you have? Right, right. Where do you blah, 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 blah. It's just on and on and on. And then. It, you're, you're standing there tapping your toe, and it's like, Eric, <laughs> let's go. You know, come on, man. Right. I mean, oh, brother. So that's, but, that's about it. Otherwise, we're all pretty much on the same page. Yeah. No, I I just, I, I, I it's like I know my, the listener, you know, the listeners of podcasts are certainly, there's some older people who listen to podcasts, but it's a young person's thing. And I'm, yeah. I'm always asking people, you know, send me, you know, send me pictures, send me this. And somebody wrote me the other day that he said, uh, yeah, I've been, I hunt with the same group of guys. Uh, we were all in fourth grade together. And I said, well, yeah, wow. but you've just got out of high school. So that's not a real, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's, yeah. not, that's not exact. But hey, you know, if you can keep that group of guys together, you're, right. you're, you're guaranteed to have like fun the rest of your life. You know, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Are you, uh, so you're down to just the one dog with, uh, just the one dog, yep. Just the one dog. Um, but cockers are small. You can get another cocker. Uh, you know, like I said, she's a little high maintenance to live with, so <laughs> we're we're doing okay. You know, and for the and for the hunting I do, and again, normally I'm with some of these other guys, and you know, they all have dogs. Um, Eric, my guy, I just spoke up. He's got a couple of really, really good uh, golden retrievers. Yeah, um, really good upland upland hunting dogs. My friend Terry Barker's got a nice setter, so you got everything. You, know, co- never, you got everything covered. Never lacking for dog power. Yeah. What do you? Uh, if you had to say there's a downside to uh, radar, is, what would it be? Excuse me, I don't I'm a, sure a, I heard a, a downside to your your cocker. Do you do you find a downside um, to it? Yeah, th- yeah. There's definitely a downside, Ron. I I think that she's you know. For grouse and woodcock, she's phenomenal. For the kind of pheasant hunting that, that we do in that, you know, that CRP type prairie right. grass, she's right. at a little bit of a disadvantage. Yeah. You know, that's it's just so thick. Yeah. It's so thick that even as even as energetic and athletic as they are, it's not easy for them to get 
get through that. Stuff. Right. And the other thing is, you know, and again, as wonderful as they are at retrieving, if you just like wingtip a rooster and that stuff, that's a big ask for a cocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I found that too. Like I, I still love to go to the Dakotas every year. And I give her, you know, I give her some ditches and some little cattail slews, but I, I've, all, I've still got pointing dogs. So it's, it's like, I don't think I could be without either, but I don't think I could ever be without her because yeah. it, I felt like for the first time, like all my dog, I, I'd say all the dogs I've kept till they died, you know, we had pretty good relationships, but this one, it, it, it's almost like she knows exactly what to do. But I keep putting her into situations where, like you said, she's not really a prairie dog. Right? She's not meant for right. sharp-tailed grouse. She's not meant for, I right. mean, if you could target a little spot, it's a great dog. But, right. yeah, trudging, trudging through, a, you know, four miles of CRP is not, I almost yeah, feel kind I mean, of, it's just I feel kind of bad. That's what, you know, she and I were hunting, um, you know, some of these, what they call IHAP areas in Iowa, and also it's the public hunting areas. I mean, they're they're basically managed almost like, like a like prairie restoration so it's yeah. it's big blue stem and indian yeah. grass and little blue stem and switch it's just heavy heavy stuff and you know so we're kind of i was thinking about this you know with her you're sort of hunting at a micro geographical scale yeah yeah, yeah. with a with the pointing dogs and my pointing dogs were always fairly wide-ranging dogs you know they're more of a macro geographic scale so i mean they ultimately that's probably a better choice uh, for that kind of cover. And especially when it's a situation where, you know, you might have say a hundred acres of cover and there might be three or four birds. Right. Sprinkled over that. Yeah. You know, you're hunting a cock or you got to cover that awfully thoroughly to yeah. get your chance. You, you, you got to, if you got a pointing dog that's, that knows its business, you know, you can turn her loose and, yeah, you know, let her go and, you know, kind of, Look, it kind of makes you look better. <laughs> you, you don't have to think. Absolutely. You don't well, have to think that. that <laughs> as, as one of my good friends, Bob Olson, who's a professional trainer uh, in Lena, Wisconsin, about forty miles north of Green Bay, likes says he likes dogs that make him look good. <laughs> 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 don't we all? Don't we all? Um, what? How far have you gone out? Have you gone out of the country, or are you always home based in the forty eight for um, your hunting? I really and... haven't, Ron. I, I took one trip years ago and did a little bit of shooting. In uh, I did one basically one day of rough shooting in the what they call the lowlands of Scotland, mm -hmm. and uh, that was actually a lot of fun. And and was in a group with some some guys from uh, Ireland who had some really nice springers. And we shot some pheasants, and I got a couple of uh, of European woodcock, which nice. was cool. And uh, but that's about it. I haven't, you know, I haven't traveled out of the country. I mean, I'm not. I've never been attracted by you know the the South American high volume dog right. stuff. That's, right. I mean, my big thing is hunting hunting birds that that I feel like I kind of have a relationship with. Right. Over my own dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I got invited to go down to uh, South America because I like to dove hunt. Since I have a place in Virginia, about 15 years ago for work, I bought it and I fell in love with just that early season dove hunting, which was just fun. It's no pressure. And honestly, after a day of dove hunting, I've shot enough shells. You know, it takes me th three boxes to get 15 doves, right? <laughs> and then this guy says, "Oh, you got to come to Argentina." You know, he said, "You, you, you you'll shoot," you know. A thousand rounds a day, and I'm like, huh? How does that become? I, you know, I don't. I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, <laughs> more power to the more power to the guys who enjoy that. But that just sounds like work. That doesn't sound enjoyable to me at all. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, I don't. You know, you, if I even just go like shoot sporting clays, you know, one round, you know, fifty shells, that's plenty. I don't mm -hmm. feel like shooting anymore after. Yeah. That. Yeah. I'm. I've, I've told everybody, I've heard people always say, you know, um, I wouldn't hunt if it wasn't for the dogs. And I'm like, yeah, maybe, but I know I wouldn't hunt if it wasn't for the friends, you know, I, I, I rarely, if I go hunting by myself, it's a quick grouse hunt around my house, you know, yeah. 
And otherwise, it's got to be, I, I got to have someone to talk to in the car, someone to have breakfast with, someone to commiserate at the end of the day and have a pity party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, with you. I think I'm probably a little more solitary. I mean, you do some I, solo. I do enjoy hunting alone with the dog. I mean, there's something about that. And especially, especially with the cocker. Because, you know, she and I can just go out, and again, it's just low stress, and we can hit hit a spot yeah. here, and a yeah. spot here, and a spot there, and, yeah. you know, How, it's just fun. I, I have not got a, a lot of, to be honest, very low numbers of grouse, a few woodcock with her. Um, did you, everybody tells me that you will end up getting these shots, these layup shots on grouse with the cocker. Has that happened to you, where... They're out there and they're just pushing them back towards you, or is that just uh, a, no. a story that no, a, a writer? I, <laughs> that's a no, story I that Glenn not, Blackwood have, told me. <laughs> oh really? That's yeah. well. Yeah. Well, you got to consider the source. Right. Um, uh, I haven't really found that. I have found that my success rate with the flushing dog is is as good, if not better on grouse and woodcock mm -hmm. than it was with a pointing dog. So, oh, that's encouraging, yeah. And that's... I had some fabulous pointing dogs. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. I, had a, I had a couple of just great, great pointing dogs. Tina, the last dog I had, I mean, she was just, she was just death on on everything. I mean, right. you know, and if she pointed, that was, if she pointed and stood there while you walked up, the bird was going to be there. Right, right. So, but that doesn't mean you could, you know, Especially with woodcock, and I'm sure you found this, hunting woodcock by yourself with a pointing dog is not necessarily a picnic because you still have to flush the damn thing. Right, right, right. And so, and you're in a place, is, is you're in a place where I like to say, you know, the sunlight goes to die, and you're trying <laughs> to get this damn bird to fly, and right. you're tangled up every which way but loose. Yeah. So. It's a lot easier to hunt woodcock with a pointing dog with two people. Uh, yeah, for sure. You go here, I go there. Yeah, we, we, someone's going to get a shot. Someone's going to get a shot. Yeah, you, quite often it's not going to be the owner of the dog when he's by himself. Correct. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> what's What's coming up on your docket for uh, you just see no stop in writing? Are you uh, still super active? And no, you, you know, it, I'm, you know I, I'm – I'm not going to stop, but I think I'm going to start slowing down. I mean, I, I, but I turned 65 on Sunday and, nice. uh, you know, I've been doing this for, for a long time and I can see myself in another year or two starting to, you know, cut back a little bit, but mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever stop. Right. You right. Know, there's always things I want to say and the things I want to write about their experiences yeah. that I want to, you know, mull over and, and see what comes out. So. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed your writing. I've read a lot. I've I've got one of your books. Oh, what's now? I'm gonna have to draw. I'm gonna have to turn on my other laptop to. Probably the tattered autumn sky. Yep, that's the one. Yep, that one's on my shelf, and you know, you, I've seen your name forever in in articles. And I, I I thought you were honestly. I didn't know you were from Green Bay, so I, you know, I didn't know if we should talk about football or if you were anti-football. <laughs> you know. But uh, well, was the great, the great, the best line about Green Bay is that someone described it as a uh, what is it, a, a, a drinking town with a football problem. So. <laughs> yeah, my friend of mine is a, a diehard Packer fan, and and I told him oh about two hours ago. I said I'm going to be interviewing Tom Davis up in he's up in Green Bay. He says was he football fan? I said I would assume if you live in Green Bay you have to fake it or you are one. I don't know. But, yeah, I, I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan, but I'm not a, a diver. You don't, fan. you don't, you don't keep season I, tickets. I would certainly, on a, you know, on an October Sunday, you know, if the choice is between watching the Packers and going hunting, that's no choice. Okay. Got it. <laughs> so he said to ask you, what is the, the, the clock at Lambeau stadium is not correct. Are you, do you know that? Like, there's a big clock at the stadium. Yeah. And it's set. He said, if he's a, if he's a Packers fan, he's going to know this. So now I can tell you're not a Packer, a diehard Packer fan. The clock is set 10 minutes off because Vince Lombardi's line to his players forever was, if you're not here 10 minutes early, you're late. And that was <laughs> – and, and so the clock at Lambeau Stadium. So apparently you passed the I'm not a big Packer I, fan uh, I'm test. I'm sorry about that. That's it's okay. Funny, though, 
it's funny though, you know, Vince Lombardi's home is just a few blocks from where I live. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I pass it or I come very close to it virtually every day when I'm walk. I take the dog for a walk in, early in the morning yeah. and we go within about a house of Vince Lombardi's old house, which is just a sort of a nondescript brick ranch in a, in a residential area. Nothing fancy, huh? Nothing fancy. Nothing it, fancy. It was funny. A couple of years ago, there were a pole, but I was, I was walking with the dog and it's on kind of a, like a circle. It's not a cul-de-sac. It's more like a horseshoe mm-hmm. that goes out to a, a, a main drag. And there are all these big, you know, like video trucks, and all this stuff parked there. And, and, and I saw and there were these, all these people that, you know, were obviously not Green Bay people. They looked more like, you know, big time TV people. They're all kind of dressed up and, you know, self-important. And I finally asked why. I said, what's going on? And he said, Peyton Manning and Brett Favre were at the old Lombardi house <laughs> doing an episode of some show Peyton Manning does on ESPN, <laughs> some damn thing. <laughs> So I was, oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> well, I know I was coming through Wisconsin one time and I couldn't find a hotel because there was a Packer game. And I mean, oh, yeah. and I, I mean, was, there's I was, a home Packer game, I think you I was, will not find, you, I think forget. I was 70 miles away. Oh, yeah. You won't find a, couldn't find a motel. Forget. It. So who, forget. who, you know, that's, who put a football team up there where there's not enough lodging? I don't get it. I don't get it's, it. It's, well, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's one of a kind. It's one of a kind, you know, and occasionally the, you know, but, you know, I, it's funny. I don't see the, any of the players very often, almost never, but Mark Murphy, the president lives in this neighborhood and I see him out walking his dogs, yeah. which are not hunting dogs pretty regularly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he always has his head down like he's deep in thought. And I suppose he is. <laughs> yeah. He's thinking about Thinking about the bottom line of the football Thinking team. Thinking about the bottom line and about you know, about issues you wished you didn't have to deal with. <laughs> Probably. And we just go hunting on Sundays instead. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, Tom, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I hope we no, are. It's been great. It's been a lot of fun, Ron. I appreciate you asking. Uh, I hope our paths can cross someday. I'll. Uh, Let's I'll... make that happen. Yeah. I mean, I th- I think the pace is good. We we could put two cockers on the ground, and. That'll uh, work. I'll take the uh, I'll take the ferry over to save a few miles on the on the truck, so that means October. Uh, yeah. October. Yeah. Oh yeah, you'll be right there. Take the ferry over. I'll meet you there, and you know, three hours later we can be hunting. All right, that sounds like a plan. All right, thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. And meeting, lead meeting. There we go.